Alrighty, Shabbat Shalom. And Shabbat Shalom to all those watching with us today. Uh, I got a message I want to give today. I've been saying with the COVID-19 virus that has been uh, plaguing the world over the last few months, that eventually the virus will subside to one degree or another. Uh, and then what happens next from there? So today is a prophetic message. It's called, Are You Preparing for the Great Famine Coming? Because I know, and I always say this, whatever you focus on becomes most real to you. And for most people in the world today, they're focusing on the virus because that's the big thing that's being talked about every day that's affecting the lives of people in every country in the world. But uh, past here, we know there's going to be great financial difficulties that are coming. Uh, in the days ahead, you know, and also the famine that's going to be coming. Matthew 24, I'm going to start there in verse 3. Matthew 24 and verse 3 says, And as he, Yeshua, was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So we went over this even recently uh, about this. It's very clear. There's no doubt what is being said. Uh... They're asking him, what is the sign of his coming back to the earth and setting up the kingdom of Yahweh? And here we are, we're in that end time. So if it was important to them 2,000 years ago, how much more important to us? So drop down to verse 7 and 8. And Yeshua says, for nation will be raised against nation, right? War that's coming. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Uh, but not so much, just a little bit, because we see these things coming. And kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and plagues and earthquakes against many places. There will be famines and plagues and earthquakes against many places. We've been seeing the earthquakes that are coming. Uh, recently, we just seen earthquakes just in the past, I you know, month or even just a few weeks, less than a month. In California, uh, major earthquakes, Idaho and Utah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, in Utah, the Mormon headquarters there they have that big big gigantic building where their headquarters is there and they have an angel there with a trumpet and when the earthquake happened that angel broke and snapped off in the trumpet and uh you know maybe something that's prophetic that's coming there but we see it we see the the plagues like uh, we're seeing here and the COVID 19 a plague like we've never seen before in modern history you know at least anyway and I would say because of the global world we're living in, probably we've never seen it like this because other plagues, uh, there wasn't a global economy. There wasn't airplanes and people traveling, millions of people every day around the world. And you don't have to be a genius. And actually, if you, if you listen to the news, uh, even a lot of the senators and congressmen are saying it every single day. If they, if, if they don't open up that economy, it's going to collapse. It can't sustain itself. So even though there's still... You know, uh, you're looking at, a, you know, a million cases just in, in Babylon, USA Babylon, and they make it sound like uh, it's under control and they're doing uh, good with it. But, but it, it hasn't subsided, you know, it may be leveling off some, but it hasn't subsided. It's and in and, and the whole world, the same thing. So we see plagues and uh, what isn't being talked about right now, what I really is the main message today is the famine that's going to come the famine that will come from there. Because I was reading an article uh, last year, probably in the second half of 2019, that was talking about the UN saying that uh, currently, you know, this is the, in, in, in their 70 years of being an organization, they, this is the worst time they've ever had as far as food shortages and, and whatnot. And that was before all these things that are coming up with the COVID-19 and also the locust plague that I'm going to talk about extensively today, what's happening. So let's go now to Luke 21 and verse 11. Luke 21 and verse 11, it says, And there will be severe earthquakes from place to place and famine and plagues. And there will be fears and terrorist acts and great signs will be seen from heaven and the winters will be severe. So, wow. I mean, what to a T. And that's why I say, you know, it's interesting. You could, people will say, you know, well, it could be a coincidence that we're having more earthquakes today. And it could be a coincidence that knowledge has increased and people are, you know, flying on airplanes and doing all these things. And it can be a coincidence that there's, there's uh, you know, uh, uh, 
a breakdown in society and the most immoral society and, 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 and the love of many waxing cold. But you can go down a list, a list, a list, a list, a list. And at what point does it stop being a coincidence? Really, at what point does it... And I say that with Yeshua being the Messiah. You know, I gave uh, those messages uh, last year, you know, on all the messages of him being the Messiah. And I said, if you just take... There's 300 Messianic prophecies in Scripture. Uh, Yeshua fulfills every single one of them. But if you just take the top 30 that no one even denies, he came from Bethlehem, you know, uh, you know, and, and, and whatnot. These, he's born of David. He was from the lineage of David. That just for one person to fulfill all 30 of those is, is like a number that's, that's out of mind. Because once you fulfill five prophecies, the law of odds and probability, to fulfill the sixth one becomes less, to fulfill the seventh one becomes less. And to keep going down that list and keep fulfilling prophecy after prophecy is amazing. And it's the same thing here. When you look at all the different end times, even winters will be severe. You know, we've had the worst winters that you can imagine what's happening uh, weather like we've never seen in, 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 in the world, you know, up till now. And, and that one thing could have been off, but it's not. Every single last thing that Yahweh said is coming to pass. And the main thing that it talks about a lot, besides the earthquakes, that's one of the triggers, is the famines and the plagues. You know, you see it a lot. The earthquakes, the famines and the plagues. Over here it talked about terror attacks, which we've also seen, uh, you know, many, 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 many of those through the time. So... Uh, let's continue. Let's go to Revelation 6. Revelation, the 6th chapter. Starting in verse 5. Revelation 6 and verse 5. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come and see. And I saw and behold a black horse and the one sitting on it having a balance in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A measure of wheat for a denarius. A denarius is like a, a day's pay. So one measure of wheat is like a full day's pay. And three measures of barley for a denarius, a full day's pay. And do not harm the oil and the wine. So clearly this is talking about famine. It's talking about prices rising dramatically because there's a lack of food. Right? And we're... We're seeing that now, people hoarding uh, grocery stores, you know, and all over the world, you know, you're seeing uh, shelves that are, you know, stocked without food. Now, up to this point, I don't think we're in a crisis mode. I think it's more panic buying than a lack of food. We haven't hit that point yet where we're lacking food worldwide, but this is what I think is coming from here as we're going to see today. Be between the virus and the world economy going into maybe depression, uh, you know, the way it looks now, anything is possible, nobody knows for sure. But while if you look at those numbers now, they've never seen numbers like this. And it's like I said, it's, it's worldwide. And the longer that this pandemic goes, the more that's going to happen. So once that kicks in, and the locusts and all the other things that we're seeing, the weather patterns, uh, you know, the, 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 the forest fires, as we're going to see, you don't have to be a genius to figure out you're going to have major food shortages, which they already have. <laughs> which we'll see, they already have major shortages already. Uh, like I said, the, the UN said up to now there was like, uh, we'll, I'll read it later, but they said there was like, I think 12 million people in that Horn of Africa that's suffering starvation right now, and that's gonna go up by 30 million people because of the locust plague that's coming there. So it will be more than 40 million people that will be suffering. So we see definitely here, this is talking about food shortage. Verse 7, and when he opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And I saw, behold, a pale green horse, and the name of the one sitting on it was death, right? Because what happens? When there's plagues and when there's famine, you get death. And Hades followed after them, and authority was given to them to kill over the fourth of the earth with sword, right, war, with famine and with death, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So it's kind of interesting, right? First, you have the sword, and I'm not going to talk about it much today, maybe in another message, but uh, I sent out a, a message a little bit ago, not a message, but I sent out a, a, an update, and in that update, I, was, I, I sent the video link showing where the virus came from, and, 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 and in the news now, this isn't some conspiracy theory or something that's in the back pages of some website. Uh, in, in, in the front pages of news now, they're saying that it's clear 
that the virus did come from the Wuhan laboratory, you know, the military laboratory that's there. It did not start in, in a fish market. So what's going to happen from here? You know, what's not known at this point is, was, uh, was China using this as, as a covert, uh, you know, way of, of, of uh, war mechanism? Or was it an accident? But either way, man, you have a, a, a worldwide pandemic. You have people dying all over the world. The world economy crashing. And already countries, as you saw in that video, like India and like some other countries, or uh, Spain, one of them, and many more will, are putting in, in the world court, uh, cases against China. They want trillions of dollars back that are lost. And you better believe China is, they're not even taking responsibility, never mind giving compensation. So this could easily lead to war. There's no doubt. It may not, but it easily could, right? So, and then the famine with death. So we see the kill of the fourth earth with sword and with famine and with death by the wild beasts of the earth. So it comes by the wild beasts of the earth. And what was this virus? It was a virus that came from wild beasts. And they actually uh, was manipulated by humans in a laboratory to put in the, the proper uh, things in that virus so it can be transferred over to a human. Because naturally it couldn't. And they manipulated the virus uh, with certain proteins to be able to, to do that. So we see that there, that, that here we have war, famine, death, and wild beasts. The COVID-19 started by wild beasts. So look at how much... The coronavirus, the COVID-19, is interrupting the world, whether it's world travel, stock markets, people working, you know, like I said, the supermarkets clearing food from the shelves in the supermarkets. And to be honest, from a worldwide level, so far, it's been pretty mild. I mean, you have eight and a half billion people in the world. You have around 200,000 that have died, right? a uh, couple of million that are infected, but that's, that's nothing compared to how many people are in the world actually, right? So this is really, we're seeing this panic and we're seeing these things happening and we're just really beginning. We have, over here we're talking about a quarter of the earth. You're not talking about a couple of million people, you're talking about several billion people uh, having these things and dying from this. So what will happen when the famine increases, right? When maybe war comes with pestilence, plagues that are going to be worse than the COVID-19. Because like I said, it will subside one way or the other, but then it's not going away. Like they said, it's, 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 it's coming back. So let's go to Exodus 10 now. Exodus, the 10th chapter. And let's read about one of the plagues that Yahweh had there. Exodus 10, starting in verse 1. And this is again during the Exodus. And Yahweh said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have made his heart heavy and the heart of his servants, so that I may set up signs of mine in their midst. And so that you may recount in the ears of your sons and the son of your son what I exerted myself to do against Egypt and my signs which I have done among them. And you may know that I am Yahweh, right? So he's, he's doing this so it could be written in the book and we could recount to our children and grandchildren. And that's exactly what we're doing. And Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, So says Yahweh, uh, Eloe of the Hebrews, Until when will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Send away my people so that they may serve me. For if you refuse to send away my people, behold, I am going to bring locusts into your territory tomorrow. And they will cover the eye of the land, and no one will be able to see the land. And they will eat the rest of that which has escaped, that which is left to you from the hail. And they will eat every tree that sprouts to you from the field. And your houses will be full, and the houses of your servants, and the houses of the Egyptians, which neither your fathers nor the fathers of your fathers have seen, from the day of their being on the earth until this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long will this one be a snare to us? Send away the men that they may serve Yahweh their Elohim. Do you not yet know that Egypt is perishing? Uh, and Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to him, Go, serve Yahweh your Elohim. Who and who are the ones with you? So then he tells uh, what's going. Uh, and then drop down to verse 12. And Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand for the locusts over the land of Egypt so that they may go up on the land of Egypt and may eat every plant of the land, all that the hail left. 
And Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and Yahweh brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. And that morning, the east wind lifted up the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt, exceedingly many. Never were there locusts like them before, and afterward none will be like them again. But I can tell you one thing, what's happening today is close. may not be exactly like that, but it's pretty close. And they covered the eye of the earth. And the land became dark, and they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left, and no greenness, greenness was left in the trees and in the plants of the field in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh hurried to call Moses and Aaron, and he said, I have sinned against Yahweh your Elohim and against you. And now, pray, forgive my sins only this time, and pray to Yahweh your Elohim that he may take away from me this death only. And he went out from Pharaoh, and he prayed to, to Yahweh. And Yahweh changed to a west wind very strong, and it carried the locusts and threw them into the Sea of Reeds. Not one locust was left in all the territory of Egypt. And Yahweh made strong the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not send away the sons of Israel. Wow. So here we have the sign of the locust. And you could read it here, and you could imagine, you know, like it says, it's eating everything, right? But here we are, we're living this today. The same way that I said a Passover you know, that we're living the second Passover. The second Passover started now. The death angel is going over. Yahweh had it, whereas people all over the world were staying in on the Passover night. These things are not coincidences. Yahweh is working. And now, this locust swarm, we're seeing locusts like we've probably never seen since this time in the Bible. And I want to read you an article here that says, Like an umbrella had covered the sky, locust swarms despoil Kenya. So this is happening in Kenya, Sudan, Ethiopia, all the Horn of Africa over there. But it's not stopping there. They're moving along. They're going to wind up going now through the spring toward uh, Saudi Arabia and coming up to Pakistan and even China. They'll be getting there by the summer. At first, villagers thought the dark, dense blot in the sky was a harmless cloud. Then came the terrifying realization that the locusts had arrived. Kenya is battling its worst Desert locust outbreak in 70 years, right? 70 is an endpoint number, right? From the beginning of the end time till now, 70 years, threatening the food security of millions. <clears throat> but the hope soon turned to terror when the giant blot revealed itself as a swarm of fast-moving desert locusts, which had been cutting a path of devastation through Kenya since late December. The sheer size of the swarm stunned the villagers. It was like an umbrella had covered the sky, just like we read over here. When the insects descended, the community quickly gathered to try to scare them off, using one arm to beat them with the sticks or bang on metal pots, and the other to cover their faces and eyes as the bright yellow insects teemed around them. The cows and camels couldn't see where they were going because there were so many, like it said here. There was darkness because of how many there were. Adding to the fear and confusion, there had been no warning the locusts were on their way. Kenya is battling its worst desert locust outbreak in 70 years, and the infestation has spread through much of the eastern part of the continent and Horn of Africa, raising pasture and croplands in Somalia and Ethiopia, sweeping into South Sudan, uh, Uganda, and Tanzania. The highly mobile creatures can travel over 80 miles in one day. Their swarms, which can contain as many as 80 million Locusts, and I've seen some that sent up to 200 million or more, and they said it could possibly even get to more than a trillion if they don't do something. But 80 million in one swarm. Locusts, adults in each square kilometer. So there are swarms which can contain as many as 80 million locust adults in each square kilometer can eat the same amount of food daily as about 35,000 people. That's like a major city. So they can eat that much in one day. Officials said the infestation poses a risk to food security, undermines economic growth, and if not controlled soon, will exacerbate communal conflict over grazing land, right? So what is it? War, famine, pestilence. In addition to the 12 million people already experiencing acute food shortages in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia, Somalia the locust crisis now poses a potential threat to the food security of over 20 more million people. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, bringing to 32 million, not 40 million, 32 million total in that region. 
The magnitude of the problem is just so big, said Cyril Ferro, who leads the organization's resilience team for Eastern Africa. The locusts are a moving target and we are racing against time. The United Nations said that if the locust numbers aren't suppressed soon, they could grow 500 times this amount by June, which would prove ominous not just for pastoral communities, but also farmers. Locusts can travel over, over 80 miles a day, and a swarm can consume the same amount of food daily as about 35,000 people. If we don't find a way to get rid of these young ones, he said, we will have so much trouble and big food shortages very, very soon. So this isn't, you know, just like a, a guess. It's not a prophecy. It's happening. This is happening before us. Very, very interesting, though. In the next chapter, Exodus 11 and verse 7, And a dog shall not sharpen his tongue against all the sons of Israel, toward man and toward livestock, so that you may know that Yahweh distinguishes between Egypt and Israel. Yahweh distinguishes between his people and the world. And the Passover report <laughs> that I got from Kenya, the miracle of the locusts passing were there. I want to read to you again. It says, uh, it's greetings from the elder there, Shalom Senior Elder in Haksameya. Uh We were really thankful to Yahweh and feel blessed for this Passover that we had total protection for him. Immediately I got greetings from you. I gave them and all were overjoyed to hear the shalom and the greetings from you. Many things are concurrently happening now, but for sure we have seen the hand of Yahweh in them all. I thank Yahweh for protecting us from the swarm of locusts. Though these locusts have been devouring everything <clears throat> to the right and the left of them in all the parts of their country, Yahweh made them just fly over our region, canopying the whole region, but not landing down to bring destruction. Really, it was a miracle from Yahweh and nothing was lost. So, wow, what an amazing miracle that we see here. And encouraging as we're looking here today, when we're looking at famine and we're looking at plagues, to know, though, Yahweh does make a difference between the world and his people. Yahweh does make a difference. It doesn't mean we're not going to go through our own baptisms of fire, but he does make a difference, and we don't have to fear it. Joel 1, Joel 1, and... Starting in verse 1, the word of Yahweh that was to Yoel, the son of Pethiel. Hear this, you old men, and give ear, all you people of the land. Has this been in your days or even in the days of your father? Tell your sons about it and your sons to their sons and their sons to another generation. So again, right? Tell this from generation to generation because we're going to see something that you've never seen before. What was left by the cutter, the swarming locusts ate. And that left of the swarming locust, the locust larva ate. And that left of the locust larva, the stripping locust ate. So we see it that, I mean, these things coming in the hundreds of millions that, that I mean, it's unbelievable. And they're big. They're really, really big like you see them. And eating, going 80 kilometers in a day and eating as much as 35,000 people and just wiping out everything, like we, we read in Exodus. There was nothing green that was left. These things are, are coming, and, and then they lay larva, and then more of them are, 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 are uh, you know, come up after that. It's just unbelievable. It says, Awake drunkards and weep, and wail all wine drinkers over the grape must, for it is cut off from your mouth, right? It's eating all the grapes. There's no grapes there. And a nation has come up on my land, strong and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion, and its jaw the teeth of a lioness. There my vine is desolation, and has splintered my fig tree. He has stripped it and thrown it down, its branches grow white. Wail like a virgin, girded in sackcloth over the husband of her youth. The food offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of Yahweh. The priests and the ministers of Yahweh mourn. The field is wasted, the land mourns, for the grain is wasted. The new wine is dried up, and the oil tree droops, right? So I've given this message several times at Sukkot on the grain, the oil, and the wine. These are the, 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 the supplement to the full life of Yahweh's people. The grain is where you get your bread from, right, which is the staple of life. The oil that you get for eating of, of the olives, you also get it for anointing, you get it for medicinal, and then the grapes, the grapes, they make the wine that is the happiness, the joy that comes. Here, it's all gone. It's all gone. There's no grain, there's no oil, 
and there's no wine. There's nothing there. Everything. Be withered farmers, verse 11. How vine dressers for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field is perished. You know, you're talking about a famine that we probably never seen. And remember before, up until about 1850, we never had more than 500 million people in the world at one time. Now you're at eight and a half billion people. So as this starts to happen, you're going to have famines like we've never seen before. The vine is dried up and the fig tree droops, the pomegranate, the palm tree, and the apple tree. All the trees of the field are dried up because joy has dried up from the sons of men, right? Joy has dried up. And uh, when we're looking, iniquity abounds, the love of many will wax cold. And I don't care who you are today, where you're coming from. Uh, like I was saying that during the, the, the passing of the death angel, the death angel didn't matter if you were rich or poor, didn't matter whether you were a buyer or seller, didn't matter whether you were a royal family or a peasant, the, the virus hits everybody. You know, even Prince Charles wound up getting the virus. And, and we see this here, that joy is dried up. Why is joy is dried up? Because nothing good is happening. You know, if you look at it, most people in the world, even atheists, would say, and here we are, you know, we're just at, at, at the end of April and 220, that this year has been horrible so far. You know, you hope something changes. You hope that it gets better. But joy is dried up because... People can't so much as go out and walk their dog anymore without getting permission from the government, you know. Uh, and I know they had to work hard to stop this, the, the plague from moving, but wow, you know, like uh, when, when you're living in a time where liquor stores are essential and people can go in liquor stores because that's an essential thing to keep open, but churches are closed, you know, and, and faith is not something that's considered essential to mental health, but liquor is. You, we're in a real bad time. And... Uh, you know, I, I, I don't see it getting better from what we see. What we see getting better is when the kingdom of Yahweh comes. That is our hope. And that's why, praise Yahweh, that this time we're going in isn't a 40-year period. It's not a 70-year period, you know. It's a time period that's going to be, you know, for several years, you know, when, when it comes to its full. But it's not going to be that long. And we need to realize this and endure to the end. Drop down to verse 15. Alas for the day. Alas for the day. For the day of Yahweh is at hand, and it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Is not the food cut off from before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our Elohim? The seed shrivels under their clods. The storage bins are laid waste, and granaries are broken down, for the grain is dried up. How the beasts groan, the herds of livestock are vexed, and there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep are perishing, right? Because there's no food. O oh, Yahweh, to you I will cry, for the fire has burned up the pastures of the wilderness and has consumed all trees of the field. The beasts of the field also long for you, for the rivers of water are dried up and the fire has eaten up the pastures of the wilderness. Right? So we didn't even talk about that. The fires. Look at Australia, what's happened, you know, in uh, maybe the past six months. The fires over there. California, the great fi uh, fires that have been happening over there. In Brazil, in the, in the rainforest, that's doing damage, like they said, unbelievable damage that's irreversible. But we're seeing this. We're seeing that this is Yahweh's wrath. I got an email a couple days ago from a good friend of mine uh, that asked me, you know, he's, he's, he's a Jewish man that's been a friend of mine for many years, and he asked me, do, do, do you think that Elohim is upset with the world? You know, what's happening here? And I think he is. I don't think you have to be a genius to figure out when you have open homosexuality rampant, when th these are world rules, you know, world laws that homosexuality is normal and you have uh, any kind of stopping of faith because face it, coming here with famine and these things is also uh, the great martyrism. Talk a little bit about that that's coming. And we see the beast power is taking effect. It's taking hold and it's changing so fast. That is the people of Yahweh we really need to prepare. Uh, how bad can it get? Second Kings 6. How bad can, can a famine get? I mean, you say, well, what if I store up food? You know, it can't be that bad, can it? Well, let's see how bad famines can get. Second Kings 6 and verse 25. Second Kings 6. And verse 25. And he prepared a great banquet for them, and they ate and drank.
Ah, uh, no, verse 25. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they were laying siege to it until the head of a donkey was at 80 silver pieces and a fourth of a cab of doves dung at five silver pieces. So just take this in for a minute. Remember, and this is the ancient world. The head of a donkey. So they're eating donkey meat, you know, which is not kosher to begin with. But they're eating the head of a donkey is 80 silver pieces. That's a lot of money. And a fourth of a cab of dove's dung, not the dove, the dung, as if five silver pieces. That's how bad the famine was. There was no food anywhere. And it happened, the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, and a woman cried to him, saying, Save my master, O king. And he said, If Yahweh does not save you, from where shall I save you? Out of the threshing floor or out of the wine vat? Right? There is nothing there. And the king said to her, What ails you? And she said, This woman said to me, Give your son, and we will eat him today. And tomorrow we will eat my son. And we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, Give your son, that we may eat him. But she hid her son. And it happened when the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his garments. He was passing by on the wall, and the people looked, and behold, the sackcloth was inside on his flesh. How bad can it get? This bad. That's how bad it can get. So it's bad enough that prices go astronomical, that you might pay $100 for a kilo of flour. You know, that's bad enough. But this is where it gets. Because when people don't have the basics of life, when they don't have food and they don't have water and they don't have medicine, then look out. Because they're going to do anything to survive. And the fact of even eating their own children, it's happened before and it will happen again. Revelation 9. Revelation 9. Verse 1. <clears throat> and the fifth cherub trumpeted, and I saw a star out of the heaven falling to the earth. And the key to the pit of the abyss was given to it. And he opened the pit of the abyss, and smoke went up out of the abyss like smoke of a furnace. And the sun was darkened, and the air, by the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke locusts came forth to the earth, and authority was given to them, as the scorpions of the earth have authority. And it was said to them that they should not harm the grass of the earth, nor every green thing, nor every tree, except only the men who do not have the seal of Yahweh on their foreheads. And it was given to them that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months and their torment is as the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in, in those days men will seek death, and they will not find it. They will long to die, yet death will flee from them. And the likeness of the locusts were like horses having been prepared for war. And they had crowns on their head like gold, and their faces were like faces of men. And their hair was like the hair of woman, and their teeth were like teeth of lions. And they had breastplates like iron breastplates. And the sound of their wings were like the sound of chariots with many horses running to war. And they have tails like scorpions, and their stings were in their tails, and their authority is to harm men five months. And they have a king over them, the messenger of the abyss. In Hebrew, his name is Abaddon. And in Aramaic, he, is, he has the name Breaker. The first woe is passed. Behold, after these things comes two more woes. Drop down to verse 20. Maybe I'll read verse 15 too. And the four cherubs were released, those having been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year, that they should kill a third part of mankind. And the number of the armies of the cavalry was 200 million. And I heard the number, dropped down to verse 20. And the rest of men, those not killed by the plagues, you would think after seeing all this death and all this horror and all this famine, that they would be on their hands and knees praying and begging Yahweh for mercy, right? And the rest of men, those not killed by the plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, that they will not worship demons and golden idols and silver and copper and stone and wooden idols, which neither are able to see nor to hear nor to walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor their witchcraft, nor their fornications, nor their thefts. And as this is going on around the world now, right, and we're just in the beginning of sorrows, I don't hear anybody, I don't hear religious people, I don't hear leaders, I don't hear anybody saying, what are we doing wrong as human beings that is causing this curse of Yahweh to come on us. People just aren't saying that. 
nowhere near it. You know what they're saying? They're saying the, the opposite, like in Isaiah. You know, the, the, the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with cut stones, right? That's all you keep hearing from President Trump. We're going to be better. We're going to be bigger. We're going to be greater than ever. Without ever talking about why is Yahweh's blessing been taken from us? Because you know something that's really, really interesting is that, and I'm going to read here, we're going to go start now in Ezekiel, the fifth chapter, is that Ezekiel 1 through 12 are all end time chapters. Remember, Ezekiel is living at the time where Judah is going into captivity in Babylon, right? So Israel already went into cap captivity here several hundred years before this. Yet the message in Ezekiel, at least 1 through 12, is to the house of Israel. This is an end time message. So this is not to Judah, except we're going to read something here to Jerusalem. But we're going to see that primarily this is a message that was told to Ezekiel that he is to go. I'm not going to, for time-wise, go into Ezekiel 2 and Ezekiel 3. But he is sent to go to the, uh, the Israelites in the nations. They're living in the nations. And even though Israelites are living all over the earth, primarily, where is the majority of Israelites living today? They're living in Babylon and they're living in Europe. So now... As we're seeing these things happen, where is the epicenter of, of this pandemic? Europe and America. And America is the worst than anybody. And in the end, who knows how many will come from this. But think about this as I'm reading this now to the House of Israel and the nations. This is a message to basically Europe and European colonies, you know, New Zealand and Australia and, them, and Babylon, USA, because that's where the Israelites are. So starting in chapter 5. He says, And you, son of man, take to yourself a sharp sword, the razor of a barber. Take it to yourself and make it pass over your head and over your beard. And take it to yourself scales to weigh and to divide them out. And you shall burn a third part in the fire in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are fulfilled. And you shall take the third part and beat it with a sword all around. And you shall scatter the third part into the wind, and I will draw out a sword after them. So what are we seeing here again? We're seeing war, we're seeing famine, you know, and we're seeing pestilence, the same things that are coming. And take from them again and throw them into the middle of the fire and burn them in the fire. From it shall come forth a fire into all the house of Israel. So we also see a remnant being saved. Through what? Through the baptism of fire. So this is something that's going to affect everybody, right? Everybody will be affected because all of Yahweh's people even need purifying, the plagues aren't for us to destroy us for sin, but they are there. There are things that we're going to go through for baptism of fire. And he says, so says Adonai Yahweh, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of the nations, and all around her are the land. So right now, now we're going to see what's going to come to Jerusalem, and then we're going to see what Yahweh says to the house of Israel living in the nations. And she has changed my judgments for wickedness more than the nations and defiled my Torah more than the lands that are all around her. For they have rejected my judgments and my Torah, and they have not walked in them, and they haven't. <laughs> I've been saying this for the last several years, how grieved I've been being over there and seeing the evilness all throughout the land. But Yahweh's spirit is not in that land anymore. And face it, it says in the end time that there'll be a point where Yahweh will give over Jerusalem and Israel over to the beast power. And then after that, Yahweh's spirit will come back there and Yeshua will come and will destroy the armies in Armageddon. But there's a point where it's not to be there anymore, you know, where the wickedness has overtaken her. Therefore, so says Adonai Yahweh, because you rebelled more than the nations that are all around you, not having walked in my statutes and not having performed my judgments, and you have not done according to the judgments of the nations all around you, and you have, and you have not done according to the judgments of the nations all around you. Therefore, so says Adonai Yahweh, behold, I, even I am against you and will execute judgments in your midst in the sight of the nations. And I will do in you that which I have not done, in which I will not do the like again for all your abominations. Therefore the father shall eat the sons in their midst, and the sons shall eat their fathers, right? Just like we're reading cannibalism. And I will execute judgments against you, and I will scatter the whole remnant of you into every wind. Therefore as I live, says Adonai Yahweh, surely, because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your idolatries, and with all your abominations, so I will withdraw, and my eye shall not spare, and I will not have pity. A third part of you shall die by the plague, 
and shall be consumed by the famine in your midst. And a third part shall fall by the sword all around you, and a third part I will scatter into every wind, and I will draw out a sword after them. And my anger shall be spent, and I will make my fury rest on them, and I will be eased. And they shall know that I, Yahweh, have spoken in my zeal, in my fulfilling my fury among them. And I will make you into a waste and a reproach among the nations that are around you in the eyes of all that pass by. And it shall be a reproach and a taunt, an example and a heart to the nations which are all around you. When I shall execute against you judgments and anger and fury and chastisements among you, I, Yahweh, have spoken it. And I will send the arrows of evil famine among you, which shall be for ruin, for which I will send them to destroy you even I will increase the famine on you and break the staff of bread to you. Yea, I will send famine and evil beasts on you, and you will be bereaved, and pestilence and blood shall pass among you, and I will bring a sword on you. I, Yahweh, have spoken. So, very clearly here, this is what's prophesied to Jerusalem and then also to Israel in the nations. Go to Ezekiel 6, one page over. Oh, right there, actually, in the bottom. Verse 1, And it happened, the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward the mountains of Israel, and prophesy against them. So first we have Jerusalem, for the abominations on the earth. Now it's to the mountains of Israel. Mountains are what? Mountains are, are, are large landmass in, in Scripture. Countries, right? So we see here <clears throat> that uh, this is who this prophecy is for. It's to the Israelites in Diaspora. And like I said, primarily Europe and U.S., there are also Israelites living in Africa, Israelites living everywhere, but this is where it's primarily Asia. And saying, Mountains of Israel, hear the word of Adonai Yahweh. So says Adonai Yahweh, to the mountains and to the hills, to the ravines and to the valleys, behold, I, I will even bring a sword on you, and I will destroy your high places. If we drop down to verse uh, 10. And they will know that I am Yahweh, and not in vain have I said to do this evil to them. So says Adonai Yahweh, strike with your hand and stamp with your foot, and say, Alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by the famine, and by the plague. He who is far off shall die by the plague, and he who is near shall fall by the sword, and he who remains and is besieged shall die by the famine." So I will fulfill my fury on them, right? By the sword, by the famine, and by the plague. War, pestilence, and famine. And we see now already, we see two or the three of those things here. If the war comes, it will only exasperate, exasperate it that much more. Ezekiel 7, next chapter, starting in verse 6. Ezekiel 7 and verse 6. And then just come. The end has come. It is awakened against you. Behold, it has come. The encirclement has come to you, O dwellers of the earth. The time has come. The day of turmoil is near, and not a shout of the hills. I will soon pour out my fury on you and fulfill my anger on you. And I will judge you according to your ways and will put on you all your abominations. And my eye shall not spare, and I will not have pity. I will put on you according to your ways and your abominations that are in your midst, and you shall know that I, Yahweh, I am Yahweh who strikes. Behold, the day comes. Behold, it has come. The encirclement has gone out. The rod has blossomed and pride has budded. So here it is. Yahweh is clearly saying, the time is here. Drop down to verse 12. The time has come. The day has arrived. Do not let the buyer rejoice and do not let the seller mourn for wrath is on all her multitude. Right? The whole uh, world economy is collapsing. So neither the buyer nor the seller is rejoicing at this. For the seller shall not return to which is sold, although they still are among the living. For the vision is to all her multitude, and it shall not return. And a man shall not hold his life strong in his iniquity. They have blown the trumpet even to make all ready, but no one goes to battle, for my wrath is on all her multitude. The sword is outside, right? And the plague and the famine are inside. So outside there's war going on, and inside the country is plague and famine. He who is in the field shall die with the sword, and he in the city, famine and plague, shall devour him. But if their fugitives shall escape, then they shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys, all of them mourning each for his iniquity. All hands shall be feeble, and all knees shall go as water. They shall also gird on sackcloth, and trembling shall cover them. 
And chains shall be on all their faces, and boldness on all their heads. They shall throw their silver in the streets, and their gold shall be an impure thing. Their silver and their gold will not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of Yahweh, right? The world economy is going to collapse. Stocks aren't going to save you. Gold and silver money is not going to save you in that day. They shall not satisfy their soul, and they shall not fill their bowels, for their iniquity has become a stumbling block for them. So it's the day of Yahweh's wrath, and no amount of money or no uh, Babylonian commercial Babylon system of finance is going to help when that day comes. And I think this is one thing that we've seen during this COVID-19 uh, situation, that you know, the governments always want to seem like they're in control of everything. But when Yahweh brings something, then that's it. You know, nobody can overcome what Yahweh has did. Amos 8 and verse 11, because wood is also going to happen at this time, it's not only going to be a famine of food, but it'll be a famine of the word of Yahweh. Amos 8 and verse 11 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares Adonai Yahweh, that I will send a famine into the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but rather a famine for hearing the words of Yahweh. So uh, we're starting to see this now, right? That as this thing is progressing, we're seeing a clampdown on churches. You know, we're seeing people getting arrested, even if there's only five or six people going to a church or a synagogue or any house of worship, they're getting arrested because, you know, they're breaking the curfew. Uh, we're seeing internet that people are being uh, monitored, you know, if they're saying something that's going against the, what the government is saying, how the, the COVID-19 started, that their accounts are being blocked and taken off. And face it, when this time comes, which isn't that far away here, uh, there will be no more freedom on the internet. So everybody that wanted that internet, that thinks it's so good, that thinks, oh, all the pleasure seeking, and you've been addicted and hooked into it, now they got you right where they want you. And in the meantime, you're being brainwashed every day by what you're reading and what you're looking at there. So uh, here we are. What we need to be doing is we need to be looking at the word of Yahweh. That's what we need to be looking at. We need to be studying his word, reading his word, and studying that. Revelation 6 in verse 9, because also, like, just going to touch on this, also we know there's a great uh, martyrism that's coming great martyrism that will also come from here. Revelation 6 and verse 9, And when they opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those having been slain for the word of Yahweh and for the witness which they had. And they cried with a great voice, saying, Until when, holy and true master Yahweh, do you not judge and take vengeance for our blood from those dwelling on the earth? And there was given to each a white robe, and it was said to them that they should rest yet a little time until might be fulfilled also the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, those being about to be killed, even as they. So, uh, that's another point that comes of it, the martyrism that's coming. There's a lack, there'll be a lack of truth at this time, and like I said, internet will be completely controlled by the, by the time that this happens. Revelation 13 and verse 5, we see the beast power uh, pros uh, persecuting the saints. I don't think I'm going to go there right now. But we also see that when the beast power comes to rise, what does he do? He comes after the people of Yahweh. You know, Revelation 12, the same thing. When Satan is cast down to the earth, what does he do? He comes after the woman who's fleeing to the wilderness, right? Let's go to Genesis 41 now. Because let's put this in together with the dream of Pharaoh. Pharaoh's dream, because it all is tied in together. Genesis 41 in verse 15. So we see that Pharaoh has this dream, right? Nobody's able to interpret it. They find out, they say, hey, there's a man, Joseph, in the prison that can interpret it. And then Joseph comes, and we'll pick up the story from there. Uh, Genesis 41 in verse 15. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is no one to interpret it. And I have heard about you saying you hear a dream to interpret it. And Joseph replied to Pharaoh, saying, Not I. Elohim will answer the peace of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream, lo, I was standing in the lip of the river, and behold, seven cows were going up from the river, fat of flesh and beautiful form, and were feeding in the reeds. 
And behold, seven other cows were going up after them, poor in very evil form and lean of flesh. And I have not seen any like them in all the land of Egypt for their badness. And the cows, the lean and the evil, ate the first seven fat cows. And they went into their stomachs, and it could not be seen that they had gone into their stomachs, and their appearance was as evil as at the beginning. And I awakened. And I looked in my dream, and behold, seven ears of grain were coming up on one stalk, full and good. And behold, seven ears withered, lean, blasted by the east wind, sprouting forth after them. And the lean ears were swallowing the seven good ears. And I spoke to the magicians, but not one is making known the meaning to me. And Yosef said to Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. Elohim has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows, they are seven years. And the seven good ears, they are seven years. The dream is one, Ikad. And the seven thin and evil appearing cows going up after them, they are seven years. And the seven empty years blasted by the east wind will be seven years of famine. This is the word that I spoke to Pharaoh. And Elohim is about to do. He made Pharaoh to see. Behold, seven years of great plenty are coming in all the land of Egypt, right? In the world. And the seven years of famine will arise after them. And all the plenty of the land of Egypt will be forgotten. And the famine will consume the land. And if you hear President Trump in his news conferences on this COVID virus, this is what he keeps saying, right? He keeps saying, this was the greatest economy. This was the greatest economy. It was the greatest it's ever been. Not realizing that these are the words of Yahweh putting, but they're over. They're over. It's not just going to go away and everything's going to come back bigger and better. The bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with, with cut stones. It's not going to work that way because you can say what you want. You can go out there and lie on TV every day, but you can't overcome the word of Yahweh. And it's very clear that it looks like the seven years, good years are over. And I said this before. I said, if you look at the last couple of years of President Obama's uh, presidency, the economy had changed and things were getting better. They were much better the last few years. And I said, we don't know. We don't know when those seven years, good years are going to end. But they certainly look now like this is it, you know, that we're getting into that, those bad years. And seven years of famine will rise after them. And all the plenty of the land of Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will consume the land and the plenty in the land will not be remembered because of the famine afterwards will be very severe, right? So these good years that have been pretty good, right? In the last few years, they ain't even going to be remembered because of how bad the famine's coming. And as to the dream being repeated to Pharaoh twice, the thing is settled because it is from Elohim, and Elohim is hastening to do it. And like I said, twice speak. Whenever you see it in the Bible like that, it's a dual prophecy. And now let Pharaoh look for a man who is intelligent and wise and let him set over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh act and let him appoint rulers over the land and take a fifth of the land of Egypt in the seven years of plenty. And let them gather all the food of these coming years and let them heap up grain under Pharaoh's hand as food in the cities and let them keep it. And let the food be for a store for the land for the seven years of famine which will be in the land of Egypt and let not the land be cut off by famine. And I've been saying this. I've been saying this the last several years. I'm working with our elders. We're working with our communities. We've been having meetings about this that we need to be preparing. And some have, at least partial, but not nearly enough. And here we are now. We, we, we wasted good time and people just didn't take it serious enough. And here we are now. And Two years to the Shemitah. Who knows what things will look in this world by that time. But we really got to prepare now. Go to verse 53. It says, And the seven years of plenty in which the land of Egypt were ended, and the seven years of famine began to come according as Joseph had said. And the famine was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And all the land of Egypt hungered, and the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all Egypt, Go to Joseph, what he says to you to do. And the famine was on the face of the land, and Joseph opened all which was in them. And he sold to the Egyptians, and the famine was strong in the land of Egypt. And all the earth came to Egypt to buy to Joseph, for the famine was strong in all the earth. Right? So this is a worldwide famine that's coming. And like I said, you don't have to be a genius to figure out, especially if war comes. And with this COVID-19, and, and, and going into possibly, if you're looking at these numbers that are coming out now economically, 
they, they used to compare and say, well, it wasn't even this, uh, it's uh, almost as bad as when the Depression. They're saying now, these numbers, they've never seen anything like it, even during the Depression. I mean, to have 20-something million people out of work in a month, 20-something million in one month, lose, they, they, we've never seen anything like this, of this sweeping so fast, but it's because it's the word of Yahweh that's coming. Genesis 47 and verse 12. Genesis 47 and verse 12. And Joseph nourished his father and his brothers and all his father's house with bread for the mouth of the little ones. Right? So he prepared. You know, that's why we, the, the plan that I've had that we've been working on is called Joseph's Storehouse. If you prepare, then there'll be something there. And no bread was in the land because the famine was exceedingly severe. And the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan were completely burned up from the famine. And Joseph gathered all the silver found in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan and returned for the grain they were buying. And Joseph brought in the silver to the house of Pharaoh. And then the silver failed, right? So first, the people, they had no grain. The famine comes, there's no food. And Joseph was smart. He prepared because Yahweh's word said to. And he had plenty of food that he was preparing there. So first they have money, so they're coming and they're buying. That'll be the first, right? The prices will go way up, but people will have some money to buy. Then when the money's gone, right? And the silver failed, verse 15, from the land of Egypt and from the land of Canaan. And all Egypt came into Joseph saying, give us bread. Why should we die before you? For the silver has failed. And Joseph said, give your livestock and I will give to you and to your livestock if the silver's failed. And they brought in their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave bread to them for their horses and for their livestock of the flocks and for the livestock of the herds and for the donkeys. And he satisfied them with bread in that year for all their livestock, right? So first the money fails. Then after that, what happens? Now they're going to bring all their possessions. They'll sell houses. They'll sell lands. They'll sell whatever you have. And then that year ended, and they came in again the second year and said to him, we cannot hide from my master that the silver and the livestock and the animals have failed. Going into my master, nothing is left before my master except our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and let us, we and our land, become slaves to Pharaoh, and give seed so that we may live and not die, and the land not be desolate. And Joseph bought all the land of the <clears throat> of Egypt for Pharaoh because each one in Egypt sold his field because his famine was severe on them and the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he caused them to pass over into the cities and from the end of the border of Egypt to the other end, right? And what happens? He makes them slaves. He makes them slaves there. Drop down to verse 23. And Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have bought you and your land today. Behold, there is seed for you and you sow the land and it shall be as you gather, you give a fifth to Pharaoh, he talks about there. In verse 25, and they said, you have saved our life. Let us find favor in the eyes of my master and we will become slaves to Pharaoh. So here it is, isn't it amazing? They use all their money, then they use all their possessions, then they give their lands and even become slaves, right? What's happening in the end times? Same thing will happen. What happens when they become slaves? The mark of the beast of Revelation 13. And are the people mad? Are they bitter? No, they're happy. Just like it says in Revelation 13, they worship the beast. So here it is, the beast power is basically causing the world situation, just like we're seeing today. And then they'll come out with vaccines and everything else to stop the world situation today. And then they'll have genetically modified food and all kinds of things for the people if they give over into this beast system. And are the people going to complain? No, they're going to be happy. They're going to say the beast power saved their life, right? But you cannot buy or sell unless you take that mark. And we see that's coming. We see that very soon, money, why are they throwing the gold and silver in the streets? Because everything is by that chip. Everything is electronically. And unless you prepared, you're not gonna make it through that time, right? And people will say, oh, Yahweh will take care of me, Yahweh will take care of me. Yeah, Yahweh will take care of you if you show faith in Him. But if you're not preparing, then you're showing no faith in Him whatsoever, and you're gonna be on your own. You're really gonna be on your own at that time. So this is real, where it really matters. And like I said, I've been urging people to do this the last several years, really since the last Shemitah, to say we need to prepare for the next Shemitah. 
you know, which who knows, this next seven could be the last seven years, nobody knows. It could be one more seven, but there's a good chance it could lead into the last seven, which coming. So I've been saying Amos 3, 7 says, For Adonai Yahweh will do nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets, right? So I'm not claiming to be a prophet, but the point of the scripture is that Yahweh will warn his people. And Yahweh has been sharing these things with me for several years now. And that's why for five years we've been building communities. For five years in our, in our communities, we're pretty good. Because we are growing food, and we are storing food, and we are getting ready. We need to do more, and we better do it quickly. But at least we're on the way there. But for people that aren't doing it, that haven't prepared nothing, uh, you're going to be in big trouble as time comes here. Genesis 45 and verse 5. Genesis 45 and verse 5. says, and now do not be grieved, and let not your anger be in your eyes, because you sold me here. This is what Joseph saying to his brothers when, when he was revealed. For Elohim sent me before you to save life. See, Joseph, that's why he went through. He went through his baptism of fire. Yahweh set his course. He set him to be second next to Pharaoh. Why? To save life. For the famine has been in the midst of the land two years, and there are still five years in which no plowing and harvest will be. And Elohim sent me before you to put a remnant in the land for you and to keep alive for you a great deliverance, right? So now we're entering this time. We're entering this time and Yahweh, he, he, he prepares this. He gives us warning to save life. But people have to take it serious. And I think that people are just so conditioned that there's always going to be food in those supermarkets and everything is just going to continue the way it is forever and it's not going to be that way. It's not going to be that way because as this great famine comes, it's, it's, it's really going to be problems. And it's time for the people of Yahweh. You have to go out there and work. You know, like Proverbs, I'm not going to go there, but Proverbs 6, 6 through 11 and verse 15 talks about go to the ant, you, the, the lazy sluggard, right? Go to the ant and watch how he works. This is the time the people of Yahweh, we need to physically be preparing. And like I said, wow, uh, you know, when we had our meeting in, in, in Kenya just a couple of months ago, and we're talking about this, I never thought just a few months later everything already would be closed down and all this, the walls would be closing in on us. But we really need to be preparing, not to panic, but we need to be preparing because we're really short on time of preparing now. Acts 4, a couple more scriptures, we'll be finished here. Acts 4 and verse 31. Acts 4 and verse 31. Because... I've been saying this for several years now. The reason why Yahweh has opened up community is community is the easiest way to protect his people in these times, right? Acts 4 and verse 31 says, And they having prayed, the place in which they were gathered was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of Elohim with boldness. Praise Yahweh. It talks about Daniel 11, right? Daniel eleven thirty two. 32. The people of Yahweh will be working and doing exploits. It's not a time for fear. It's a time for faith. And Yahweh's people, even during this time, will be working and bringing people to faith. The assembly of those men who were believing had but one soul and one mind, and no man among them concerning the possessions that he possessed would say that they were his. Rather, everything that they had was in common. That's the way it is, right? You're not going to have a community of believers, and one guy has a bunch of food, and somebody else over here is starving. No way. And with great power, the apostles were testifying of the resurrection of the Master Yeshua, and great grace was upon them all. And there was no man among them who was lacking. For those who had possessions, who had possessed fields and houses, would sell them and brought the price of whatever was sold. And laid them in the feet of the apostles, and it was distributed to each according to as many, according as any had need. And Joseph, the once remained Barnabas by the apostles, which being translated as son of comfort, a Levite, a Cypriot by race, a field being his selling it, he brought the proceeds and place them at the feet of the apostles. So this is where we're at. It's not the time for hoarding things for yourself. It's the time that if there are some brethren out there who have resources, we need to get them in and we need, you know, I'm, 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 I'm getting swamped in the last month from everywhere in the world of brethren, you know, in the third world asking for help where we can put seeds down, where we can we could build uh, more wells, get more wells, water sources, you know, where we could be growing more food. You know, praise Yahweh. Like I said, in Kenya, we have a big 
area there where we can grow a lot now and we're storing it for all the people in that region but there's a lot of other needs that are still there you know a lot of other things we can be planning now because I believe six months a year from now may be too late we may not be able to you know it may be too late for this so if there are brethren there uh, that can help you know this is the time really to do it. community living is a major way that Yahweh can protect his people and supply them with food and that's why I say don't leave the camp as long as you're in Yahweh's camp, you're protected. Once you leave the camp, you're on your own. Last scripture, Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33. Because there are people that are going to listen and there are people that aren't going to listen. But I do believe that, and I've said this for years, being in Israel, that Yahweh set me a watchman, you know, from Jerusalem to the nations. And... Uh, to, to prophesy of many of these things. Ezekiel 33 says, And the word of Yahweh was to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people, and say to them, When I bring the sword on it, on a land, and take one man from the people of the land, their borders, and set him for a watchman to them. And when he sees the sword coming on the land, and he blows the ram's horn, and warns the people, and the hearer hearing the sound of the ram's horn, and does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes him, his blood will be on his own head. He heard the sound of the ram's horn and took no warning. The blood shall be on himself. But he who took warning, he shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the ram's horn, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes his soul from them, he is taken in his iniquity, but I will require his blood from the watchman's hand. And you, son of man, I gave you as a watchman to the house of Israel, and you shall hear the word from my mouth and warn them from me. So, uh, this is the warning. We see all the warning signs out there. We see what Yahweh is doing. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a new day. The cloud has moved. The world is turning. And only Yahweh knows the timing. I've come to realize that a while ago. That we don't know this transitional period that's going to go. We have no idea. But one thing is certain. Things are moving fast right now. We see that with the swarm of locusts, weather patterns... We already know the millions of people that are already having famine in Africa. And we know the famine is only going to get worse, particularly as the financial situation gets worse. So I am blowing the horn to the people of Yahweh now and saying, it's the time to prepare. You've got to get yourself ready spiritually, of course, first. You've got to get yourself ready. I pray everybody did that at Passover time that just passed. Now we're, we're in our, our weekly counts to Shavuot. So this is an important time here between Pesach and the forgiveness of sin and taking the leaven out of our life to Shavuot, the giving of the Holy Spirit. So it's a preparation time, you know, these seven weeks that we have between Pesach and Shavuot. But, but the time is really here. Uh, like I said, I've been warning, making the plans of Joseph's storehouse, helping to build communities, get supplies. But now it's up to the elders and the brethren to take it serious to plant the harvest, to coordinate exchange programs. This was one of the things we had within our kibbutzes that we wanted to have, where one kibbutz might be growing this and one growing that, and we can exchange. I don't know if that's going to be possible now, but it's it's a part to it. And maybe right before I end here, because people always ask about the seven-point plan, uh, maybe I could just briefly go over the seven-point plan that I sent out a few months ago. Uh, actually sent out the end of the year for the elders and sent it out to the brethren uh, back in the end of January. And basically it's it's a seven a bullet point, seven point plan that I believe every community should put in place starting now to be ready before the coming Shemitah. <laughs> we were planning this before the Shemitah, now we're planning it because of the disasters. But it's basically seven things that make sense. Number one, water. You have to have water you can't just rely on city water. You need to have well. You need to have some source of water where you are. Without water, water is life. You'll never survive. Uh, aquaponic system, if possible. That could be great for growing food and also fish. Food dehydrator. So that as you're growing food, you could, you could store food long term with a dehydrator. Having a vacuum sealer. So that if you're even with your grain and whatnot, you don't get bugs and whatnot, that you could seal it. Uh, create a dirt cellar. Dirt cellars are very easy to do. Just dig six to eight feet below the ground and you could store there uh, you know, all kinds of stuff in the dirt cellar. 
Jarring or canning fruits and vegetables, another great way to uh, preserve. And number seven, if possible, to acquire small solar panels if you don't have electricity during these times, because even just a small solar panel can help with little lights and, and whatnot. So this is the plan from uh, Joseph's Real Storehouse and the plan that I've been sharing out today. And I pray that Yahweh's people will take the heat and take the warning. And as the times are coming ahead, like I said, that we're just growing more in faith and getting stronger in our relationship to Yahweh. Because what happens is, like it says in Luke 21, 28, when you see these things begin to happen, have courage and lift up your heads because your salvation draws near. So we, every single true believer, every believer that has the hope of the resurrection, every believer that fully believes with all his heart, mind, and soul of Yeshua coming back to the earth, this should be a happy time. And as much as we see destruction around us on every avenue, it should be a time of joy for us, mixed with sorrow, as you see a lot of things going on in the world, but joy for the future that we know Yahweh's kingdom is coming. Yahweh bless. Shabbat Shalom.